Welcome to the first episode of Heart Talks. So this is something new that I'm doing on the channel. I had this idea that I wanted to have a conversation with individuals in the field of cardiology who I think you should know about. Um, and I've had this idea for a while now, and I've been in talks with our first guest um, for a while to get him on the channel. Finally, it's happened. So thank you. So firstly, welcome Sanjay Gupta, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who you may know as um, his YouTube channel name, York Cardiology. So welcome, Sanjay. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. No, it's a real pleasure. Um, so Sanjay, I really enjoy watching your videos on YouTube. But before we get into that, I just want you to introduce yourself to the audience. Um, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist. Uh, I work at York Hospital. I've been a consultant there for 10 years. I have an interest in cardiac imaging and um, you know, general cardiology. Um, and that's about it. That's all there is to say about me. Okay, fantastic. So if we take a step back, because there's a lot of um, aspiring medical students, medical students and junior doctors who may have an interest in cardiology. So can you tell us why you decided to go into cardiology in the first place? Yeah. Uh, the, the reason was really, uh, when, I was, when I was young, my father had a heart attack. So I was very young at that time. And it was always a case at that time that my family was so impressed by the doctors that were looking after him uh, that they felt that that is what I should be aspiring to when I grew up. And really, um, they wanted me to do medicine. I was an only child. They had a lot of aspirations for me. I wanted to fulfill them. I never thought of anything else. And then when I went into medicine, the aim was to do cardiology, although I don't think I was bright enough to just get straight into cardiology. So, you know, I sort of got my grades and I did my MRCP and I struggled with that. And then there were no jobs. And uh, finally, I decided to apply for a diabetic job and I didn't even get that. And I was almost left without a job when someone just said, oh, look, you know, someone's called in ill and there's this vacancy in cardiology in uh, Manchester. And I took that on and luckily things just worked out and um, I gained experience. I enjoyed the specialty. It was a specialty that had always inspired me. Uh, and I've enjoyed it ever since. And so things just worked out um, and I was fortunate. No, absolutely. And you mentioned earlier that within cardiology, you're in the specialty of imaging. So how did you decide to embark on that? <laughs> I didn't want to do anything else. Okay. <laughs> Cardiac intervention um, seemed like too much hard work and it just, it, 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 it just didn't suit my personality, I don't think. I didn't think I liked the idea of being alone in the middle of the night in a, in a lab. Um, so I never really went into it uh, without as much commitment as some of the other trainees and imaging seemed like a nice kind of um, a more relaxed specialty subspecialty at that time you know you could do electrophysiology and you can imagine you know if you're not into electrophysiology it's a very boring um, <laughs> subspecialty if you're not into it if you are into it then of course uh, you know it's different but I wasn't I found it really uh, difficult and complex and a bit boring. Intervention was too too stressful and imaging was what was left. And, and so I sort of invested my um, learning in echo and MRI and then, you know, got a post in, at York. Uh, the thing that really interested me was sort of basic general cardiology. That was the thing I really enjoyed, you know, when I was a medical student, listening to murmurs, trying to work out physiology, that 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 side of things uh, I really enjoyed. But when you 
become a trainee and then when you develop you start realizing that actually in the western world the kind of cardiac conditions you come across are pretty well much very similar you know it's very limited whereas if you're working in somewhere like india or somewhere like there you see a lot more cardiac pathology and it becomes very very interesting um unfortunately now you know the, in the Western world, it's mainly ischemic heart disease, and very rarely do you see something, you know, um, the kind of rheumatic disease, that kind of thing. That uh, a lot of a lot of books, when they were written, the books that we read when we were training, um, they referred to those patients, and that kind of you don't see that much. So I did a, a stint in India uh, during my elective, and I really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it you know, to see so many different forms of um, cardiac pathology. No, that's fantastic. And actually, my uh, follow up question to that was, have you trained elsewhere? You mentioned that currently you're a consultant in York, in, in the UK. Um, have you done training elsewhere? And you mentioned India as an elective? So, um, I, after after I did uh, the majority of my SBR training, I went to the Brigham and Women's in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and I spent a year there as a as a lecturer at Harvard Medical School, and um, I did my training in MRI, which was relatively new at that time, so it was very exciting MRI, uh, cardiac MRI. So I trained there for a year. Sure, sure. Um, so it sounds like cardiac MRI is one of your focus in terms of practicing in cardiology. Is there any other imaging modalities that you do in York? Yeah, so a lot of our, um, the, the, you know, York hasn't got a cardiac MRI scanner. So although I trained in cardiac MRI and I went to the Brigham and Women's the aim of that was to make myself more sellable at a consultant interview, which it did. You know, it, it was one of the best things I've done, not because of the immense amounts of knowledge I acquired, because I didn't, um, but because it just looked very good on my CV to be uh, at a center of excellence for cardiac MRI. When I came, York didn't have cardiac MRI but they wanted a general cardiologist and I also had echo training so I was uh, capable of doing echocardiography, stress echocardiography, transesophageal echocardiography so that was what I was doing when I was appointed in York and that's what I've done since. Initially the aim was to set up a cardiac MRI service but it all got uh, quite frustrating because you know uh, there's no money and trying to set up a service is incredibly difficult um, at the best of times. Um, so, you know, I took on my job and I, I did a lot of echocardiography. I did a little bit of cardiac MR initially, uh, but then I just got into the kind of life of a general kind of DGH cardiologist and you just do your thing. And perhaps that's why I ended up venturing this way because after two or three years it just becomes a little bit humdrum and you think oh gosh is that it is this is this all I'm going to do for the rest of my life and and that probably uh, was one of the things that led me to doing what I'm doing now which is I still have my full-time job but I like my uh, patient education I like doing other stuff and that keeps me happy <laughs> um, because you know Otherwise, it can be very uh, monotonous once you once you get there, and after two or three years, you know, it can be quite it can be quite tough. Absolutely, um, and in terms of you mentioned medical education, um, you've been on YouTube now for a few years, and it's evolved since in terms of what people put out there on YouTube. But when you first um, decided to embark on it. it. It was very different, I can imagine. So what made you think that would be a good idea or a good suitable platform to educate? Yeah, I mean, 
the the what happened was when I went for my consultant interview at York, I joined a course run by someone online to to on how to do well in your consultant interview. And this chap seemed very with it. He'd run this beautiful course. He he taught me loads. And when I went into the interview, it was amazing. You know, it was amazing. It was like I knew, I knew instantly that I would get the job. I wasn't. Uh, I was up against someone who was far more experienced. Who was someone who was local. Who was known. But, and that was that wasn't because of me it was because of what I'd learned from this chap so uh, I sort of gained some confidence and uh, I, I got the job and I did my thing about two or three years later the same guy contacted me and said look you know um, I want to talk to you about private practice have you ever done any private work and I said no I haven't and he said look you know how about we chat about how we could get you up, set up privately and I said okay that's a good idea because it was getting a bit monotonous and I'd like to do something so he said okay we'll do this and have you ever thought of just putting yourself out there and maybe doing two or three videos on YouTube and I said oh okay yeah I'll do that and uh, that's when I did my videos uh, it was for that purpose initially but what was amazing was you know I just did it because I just said what I knew. But what was amazing was the feedback that I got. So it became really interesting because I think, gosh, people are interested in what I have to say. I mean, you know, I never thought that I was saying anything that was particularly interesting, but it suddenly made me realize, uh, A, the privilege of the position I was in as a cardiologist, and also the fact that there are people out there who crave for the knowledge that I take for granted. Uh, and in some ways that then took on its own life. I had done it for one purpose, but then I started realizing that actually you wake up and you find that someone's read your, someone's listened to you and they've said something nice to you. And that was very empowering. It made me feel really happy and confident and excited. And I thought, gosh, this in itself is just a wonderful thing to do because it gives me so much happiness, so much pleasure. And then uh, I started devoting more and more time to doing it because I could see that there were people who found it valuable. Sure, no, absolutely. I mean, I before we started recording, I, I told you one of the main reasons I joined was, you know, seeing other educators like yourself um, bringing about awareness of heart disease, but in a way that is very understandable, relatable, and you feel empowered listening to it. So I could certainly, that certainly comes across in your videos. Um, how do you choose a topic every time you are preparing for a video? Yeah, it's, it's quite difficult. I mean, there, you know, the, there's no rhyme or reason. I sort of, whatever I'm doing at the time, if I find something interesting about it, or if I sort of question commonly held wisdom about something, then that makes me want to know whether what I'm saying is inherently a reasonable question or not. So I go around that. So for example, you know, Everyone, you know, you do cardiology, everyone talks about, you know, if you have a heart attack, you should give patients aspirin and you should give patients uh, ticagrelor and you should give patients statins and all this kind of thing. But then to my mind, I said, well, everyone says that, but how good are these medications? How good, you know, where is that data? And the reality is, you know, when I put that out and I ask my colleagues and everyone else, they'll give me a percentage of relative uh, risk reduction, etc. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, how good are, how all this that I do and I take for granted because someone else has told me that's what you do, how much of a difference does it really make? And then when you start looking, you realize that actually it doesn't make a huge difference. We do it because it makes a difference, but actually not a huge difference. And it's only important because everything else we do doesn't really make much of a difference at all. So, you know, uh, so that 
makes me question, you know, actually, what are we doing? And shouldn't patients know this information? Shouldn't patients be given this information? Uh, and shouldn't they feel like stakeholders in their own management? And somewhere, I like the idea of a doctor being someone who is an educator and an enabler, rather than someone who says, you know, I know what I'm doing, you don't know anything, just listen to me and take this. No, because no one knows. The reality is we don't know. We, we do things because we're told do this, right? And some study will come out, but there are so many layers behind that study coming out. You know, there is a vested interest in uh, the trial. There's a vested interest in the journal publishing that trial. There's So when you have all this and then we just come out and just regurgitate the headlines. In some ways, okay, that's okay. But how does that set me apart from anyone else? Because everyone will get that, you know, take aspirin, you've got to take aspirin. And I say, okay, you, we say you take aspirin and this is the data. And when I start looking in, I find that actually the data is really difficult to find, even though all our advice is based on quantitative research. So when you have quantitative research, at the end of that day, there has to be a number that tells you something is so much better than something else. Mm -hmm. But that number is incredibly difficult to find. And I don't know whether you, whether you find it easily or not, but I find it incredibly difficult, you know, just to try and work out a number needed to treat over a duration of time, to be able to give people that information. Because I think inherently, you know, people should feel like they have a choice. We shouldn't be enslaving people and saying, oh, you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you've got to do that. You say, well, look, this is, these are the things that work. They don't work great, but they work a bit better than, you know, what we're doing at the moment. And what do you think? Does it work for you? And, you know, sometimes you have a 85 year old who says, actually, no, I don't want to take a statin. You know, I've done I've done my time. I've got a good life. I want to be left alone. And that's OK, too. You know, as a, as a doctor, then you say, well, look, you know, I respect I respect your wishes. This is you. This is about you. It's not about me. It's not about a protocol. It's not about a guideline. It's about you, the patient. And I'm here to work with you. And if you go along with what I'm recommending, great. And if you don't, that doesn't mean I, that doesn't mean that we're now not there to support you. Whatever it is, my job is to give you information yeah. and in a language that you can understand. So that is sort of how my mindset has evolved over uh, the course of this time. And uh, yeah, and that's what I do now. Yeah, yeah. And also, Sanjay, in terms of availability of information, um, you know, with, with the internet, everything is at everyone's fingertips, everything is so accessible. And patients, you know, they, uh, they come with their questions that the way we are inquisitive about our treatment plans, our management plans, patients also have similar questions. So I think it's helpful to go in with that mindset. Um, but do you think having prepared these videos, these um, the content for the channel has helped you align your practice as well as your education? Because they're very much aligned. What you're doing on the channel is giving information. And presumably in your practice, as you said, you're giving information for the patients to make their own decision. Absolutely. I mean, I think my, my practice has changed completely, um, where I am far more willing to sit down with patients and talk about which medicines they can stop or which medications uh, they, they're taking just for the sake of taking. So I'm very much into this. The first thing I've started realizing is that actually, you know, whilst a lot of medications that we give are for quantity of life, life prolongation, the reality is that 
is based on population-based studies and the patient themselves is an individual and you will never know. You will never know whether by giving them a statin you've made them live longer and that patient will never know whether by giving them statins you've made them live longer. So I always focus on quality of life first and I always tell the patient that the most important thing is your quality of life. And we're here to try and make your quality of life better. And if I, in trying to give you things which may help prolong your life and making your quality of life miserable, then you need to tell me that. Uh, and that I think is really important, trying to get patients to understand that the only thing that really matters for the individual is their quality of life. Uh, life without quality is no life at all. And for a lot of patients, you know, that, that I think spending a little bit of time talking to the patient about that, it can be incredibly helpful. In some ways, it empowers them and it liberates them because most patients who come to you will say, oh, what's gonna happen to me? Am I gonna die? Is something bad gonna happen to me, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, well, I don't know whether you are or you're not. These are the medications that help and we can give you those. But the most important thing that you can do is to try and work on your quality of life. You know, I know you work really hard and I know you're really stressed and I know that because you're stressed, you smoke and because of that, you eat badly, et cetera. But, you know, if you're going to ask me, oh, will I still be there to see my daughters grow up? I say to you, why be there for them now? This is the time, right? I don't know what's going to happen. No one knows. I don't know whether I'm going to be here. But the important thing is for you to feel that you have some control. And you actually do have control over the only thing that we have control over, which is our quality of life. And, and that is the most important thing. So, you know, I think sometimes when you have a little bit of time and get down to that human to human level and you just talk to them about things like that rather than saying oh you need this you need this you need this you develop a really um good relationship with the patient that's what i have found through this that you know patients will come to me and say look we trust you we trust you because we understand what you're saying it's not some kind of dark art where I need to take this medicine and this medicine and this medicine, we understand what you're saying. And because we feel that we have a choice, we agree to take what you're taking, what you're recommending. So yeah, I think, I mean, and I, I, I enjoy what I do a lot more now, because I get so much more out of my conversations with my patients than I did when I started, which was very much the guideline says, do this, do this, do this, we'll start you on this and we'll see you in six months. And working as a consultant in a busy district general hospital, how do you balance the time with your commitments in the hospital and making content online? Yeah, it's, it's it, content creation is incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult. And, you know, I wish I could be more um, organized and more regimented, but I find it very, very difficult. It just really depends. The, the problem is when you get started on something like that, it's a constant stress in your mind because you think, oh my God, I've got to do something, I've got to do something. But then there are so many things that we do and I, gotten into the habit of asking questions about everything you know having an alternative viewpoint about everything we do in in um, medicine so it's becoming easier to try and write down my thoughts in a way that I could then use to try and talk about something I, I find that viewers you know they're, they're a lot of times, certainly when you start up something like that, I think people end up buying into you, the person you are, rather than necessarily what you're saying. You know, initially it's important that they feel, but then if they feel that you're um, someone who's coming from the right place, who's trying to be honest and, uh, you know, doesn't have an ulterior motive, then people, I think, generally just appreciate anything, any kind of communication uh, that you and they appreciate the fact that we work, um, we have busy jobs um, and they're patient and they're um, kind and 
it is hard it's hard i'd love to i'd love to take time out and do it but the problem with that is that when you create content you want to get it out straight away so if i get 10 free days and i produce 10 bits of videos i want to get those 10 videos out that same day i can't i can't I can't hold back because I feel like, oh, it's come out of me. I can't wait for that, that gratification where um, you put it out and you see what people have to say, et cetera. So I have to be a lot more disciplined, I think. Yeah, yeah. And you're right in terms of getting that immediate yeah. feedback. It's always so helpful because it kind of guides you in terms of which direction to go. But I remember this time, around about this time last year, where I was thinking of creating my own channel. And I called you because, you know, um, I've been watching you online for so many years. And what you said to me really stayed with me. I think the, the advice you gave me was, you know, just to be yourself which is actually quite difficult to do online. Um, but, you know, that's, that's so helpful. I mean, how did you come to that realisation that it's so important to, um, you know, be just true to the person you are? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it was even, even, the, even the first two or three videos I put out, they were so amateurish. And I found it amazing that people were still willing to listen. I think sometimes a person's personality shows through. I mean, you know, I'm, I enjoy talking. I enjoy sitting down with people. I enjoy, it's gotten a lot more uh, since I've been doing the videos, but I've always enjoyed that. And I guess when I look at myself and I think, okay, well, what is my strength? Am I intelligent? I'm not. Am I uh, technically very gifted? Not, not at all. Am I like someone who's published loads? Not at all. My, my strength really lies in communication. My strength really lies in just sitting down and chatting and establishing rapport. And I guess, you know, that's sometimes that just shows through when you're doing something like this, the, you know, this idea that actually I'm just, I'm just an ordinary guy, really. I'm just happen to be in a in a great profession and have uh, chanced upon a place where I could, you know, open myself up. So yeah, I think I I don't think I ever went out thinking oh, I'm going to be extra professional or I have to be myself. It was literally just you get the feedback and people say, oh, the, you seem not, you, you know, and so I said, yeah, I'll just do a bit more and a bit more. And, uh, and seven or eight years later, the majority of the feedback I get is about the fact that, you know, people aren't looking for uh, perfection. Uh, people are looking for uh, a, a more human interaction. And, uh, you know, and that I think is, is one of the best things I've learned, which is that you shouldn't be afraid to show your flaws uh, because you have to be relatable. You, the aim should always be not that the doctor is up here and the patient is here, but that you are two humans and you're sitting and you're supporting each other. And, uh, and that I think is what everyone craves uh, in medicine you know, that ability of just feeling like you're supported and that someone is non-judgmental and they're happy to listen to you and then they're just happy to impart anything they know from their own experience that may be valuable to you. Yeah, and I think that human quality certainly comes across in your videos, Sanjay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's such a nice um, note to end this conversation on because certainly that factor when i watch your videos i certainly get that sense that i'm speaking to you or hearing you in a clinic and i'm sure that's the kind of feedback that you get in your videos um so please continue doing what you're doing i'm sure so many other people who are watching this um conversation also enjoy listening to you um so tell us where we can find you and i'm going to um, link all this information in the um, in the in the contents below. 
Thank you. So, so my channel is called Your Cardiology, and it's on YouTube. Um, and I try and post uh, something once a week. Uh, it doesn't go <laughs> according to plan most of the times, but uh, yeah, that's where you can find me, Your Cardiology on YouTube. And highly recommended. Uh, so thank you very much, Sanjay, once again. Thank you much for having um, me. Um, it really means a lot. Uh, I'm excited about everything you're doing, and I'm, I think, you know, it's great. I, I'm, I, I will be very happy to see your channel flourish, and you flourish as a cardiologist. It's very kind. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Thank you.